My name is Ray Lee, and today I'll cover building Flutter, uh, responsive Flutter websites easily. So the key words here are responsive and easily, and we'll also cover getting started with building Flutter websites. Responsive design um, and development has been a challenge for quite a while because the need to support multiple device sizes is not a trivial matter. But there is a solution, and I'm happy to be able to share that with you all today. So let's get started. Today, uh, before we get started, let me just go uh, over uh, what we'll end up with, what you'll be able to do at the end of this presentation. Let's take a look at a non-responsive website. Uh, so to open, PowerPoint takes a bit clicking on a link to, for it to open. Um, so this is um, a website I built, and right now it's not responsive. Um, you can see that it was built mobile first uh, because Flutter is a mobile first framework, which is really great for design because we get to build mobile first and then uh, build it responsive for desktop. So it works pretty great on mobile. But at larger screen sizes, well, it's, uh, it works, but it doesn't look uh, responsive. The text is a bit small and the image is too large, et cetera. Now let's go and take a look at a version of this website that is responsive. Ta-da! Now, the screen I'm sharing is a 4K screen, and it's pretty large, but this layout scales, and the text is very readable, and the elements are also very readable. And what's even more exciting is that it now responds to uh, device screen size changes. So when we have, say, an iPad layout, it looks good on the iPad or on an iPhone. It looks good on iPhone too. And even on very, very tiny screens, we have it where it automatically scales and fits even the smallest of screens. So that's what we'll, you'll be able to do at the end of this presentation. The key takeaways are responsiveness is hard, but it doesn't have to be. We can simplify the development of responsive apps with the responsive framework. And building websites is easier than ever with Flutter, and you should get started today. So I hope with everything I'm about to share, uh, you'll be motivated to start doing Flutter web development. Um, I'm going to cover a better way to think about responsive development um, because a lot of the current approaches to responsiveness, it, we can solve a lot of those challenges um, through a new type of thinking and also tips and tricks for solving the responsiveness challenge. So the agenda, um, just a quick summary of everything we'll cover or try to cover is I'm going to give an intro to the responsive framework to make your Flutter app responsive automatically. Um, I'll convert an existing app to Flutter web. Um, that might be of interest to all of you out there, Flutter developers who already have an app and might want it to work on the web. Um, I'll cover the responsiveness challenge, give an overview of what are the challenges with the traditional approach, for example, bootstrap um, and the traditional thinking solving the responsiveness challenge, providing the solutions to all the problems that I'm going to be discussing. And then uh, we're going to live code. Uh, I'm going to live code the Flutter website. So this is really exciting. We're going to remake the Flutter website in Flutter. Um, and part of that is creating the pixel perfect animated carousel header, um, which just to give you a preview, uh, we will build this right here. Uh, that's something to look forward to. And stick around, please. <laughs> oh. 
And um, we're going to talk about a layout discussion. I'll walk you through uh, the thought process for um, deciding between uh, how to lay out and layout and keeping it as simple as possible. Um, we'll create a mobile and desktop version of and layout. And then also, if we have time, embed our app inside a Flutter website. So you can embed your Flutter app inside another Flutter app. Uh, to get started, you can follow along and uh, um, get, uh, use the responsiveness framework uh, from uh, these links that I posted. So um, the responsive framework you can find oh, on GitHub. And it's published as the Dart package. So you can access it easily, import it easily into your project. Now, let me explain a bit about what the responsive framework is. And the best way to do that is to um, go to our earlier website project. The code that you see on the screen is the code um, is the website code. So let's uh, just run this real quick. Main, close others, and press play. Oh, uh, let me get started with Flutter Web. Press play. All right. Um, so if you want to use Flutter Web, build websites for Flutter Web right now, um, you'll need to be on the beta channel. Um, and once you're on the beta channel, um, you just do Flutter create period. And then that will generate the web files for your Flutter project if you um, don't have them already. Uh, wait for it to load a bit. Ta-da, okay. Going back to the code, let me walk through what the response uh, framework does. So you can see that the actual routes are uh, not in this file. The main area of interest is the responsive wrapper. Adding this wrapper allows our website to become automatically responsive. You, uh, you can set these responsive breakpoints to control the specific behavior at a specific size. And to give you a demo of that, uh, let's open up this responsive um, window again and take a look at the behavior at um, 800. So we have the uh, responsive breakpoint set at 800. And here you can see that the layout is between 800 and 1,000. And the behavior here is that it's scaling it's automatically scaling. Whereas if we move to, say, a mobile layout um, defined by the mobile responsive breakpoint, it becomes a mobile layout. And the layout now resizes. So the difference between scaling, um, auto scaling, and resizing is that auto scaling essentially locks locks the layout in place. So every element um, is relative to every other element and preserves its position and size. With these, these responsive breakpoints, you can create um, a responsiveness for your app and have it almost automatically work. OK, back to the slides. Um, so the responsive wrapper, as you uh, saw, the usage was quite simple. Um, you just add it to your builder method. Or you can also wrap a widget with the responsive wrapper. Here, we're using the responsive wrapper builder. And for responsive breakpoints, um, they operate off of density-independent pixels. Um, uh, density independent pixels, or as the Flutter SDK would like to call them, logical 
uh, pixels. And that's uh, the 450, the 800, 1000, 1200, and 2460 are those uh, density independent pixel sizes. So we covered a bit about the scale versus resize behavior. Your Flutter app by default resizes, um, and the responsive framework allows you to scale at certain sizes. Um, and auto scale, as you saw, is the secret of the responsive framework. And by locking in a resolution, you gain the ability to preserve a pixel perfect layout exactly the way you want at any screen size you want it. Now, this is really great, um, but you might be wondering how does this work? Um, it, it's not, <laughs> me personally, I don't like to use code if I don't understand you know, a bit about how it's working, unless it's, of course, you know, a cache manager, because those things uh, are way too complex. So let's uh, jump into this really quickly and see how this is working. Um, there's a lot of code here, um, and a lot of it is you know, what the framework provides you, because um, there's a, so many edge cases that uh, this framework I built takes care of. But the actual key to making everything work is something that Flutter provides us. It's called the fitted box. Now, what the fitted box does when placed um, with the container is that it forces the container to the size of the fitted box, scaling, rescaling, uh, scaling it to the size of the fitted box. And all the calculations above in this widget um, in this framework are to provide the correct um, scaling um, to leverage the fitted box's ability to uh, scale its content. Um, so you can look into the code. Um, it's This is the magic here. It's very simple um, and made even simpler with the framework. All right, we're doing pretty good on time. So let's actually convert an existing Flutter app into a responsive Flutter app. I have a Flutter Games app here. So I made this two years ago in 2018. It was my first Flutter app. And it's been a good demo for a lot of the um, capabilities of Flutter that I've been experimenting with. So let's just build it and see how it looks on the web. Ta-da! Oh no, <laughs> we're on a 4K screen and this definitely doesn't look good. This is way too small and yeah, this is not a good responsive experience because it's not responsive. Let's see what we can do to fix that. Okay, um, here I go. In the material app, I'm just gonna provide the responsive builder. So builder context widget. Uh, responsive builder uh, wrapper dot builder widget. So the builder widget here allows us to essentially provide the responsive wrapper to every single um, wit uh, child widget, such as uh, the home, the main page here. And I'll just copy the responsive builder code from our previous website and paste it so we don't have to type everything over again. And then press play. And let's see how that looks. Oh, <laughs> unfortunately, sometimes hot restart doesn't seem to work um, on the web too consistently. Um, maybe it was a recent update or something.
Ta-da! Oh, wait. <laughs> We've added the responsive wrapper, but uh, we can't celebrate just yet because this doesn't look the way we want it to. Things are still too small. The solution is to adjust some of these responsive breakpoints. Um, so right now, we're on a desktop layout, and we definitely want to scale it. And what we can do here is we can set the um, scale factor. But first, let's set it to auto scale to true and see what happens. Ah, nothing much, but that time hot reload worked. So th uh, thankfully, now let's add a scale factor of 1.5. What this does, you'll see, is increase the size of our layout by 1.5. Nice. Uh, that still looks a bit too small, though. Um, we do want it a bit larger, where our items you know, take up more of uh, the screen. So let's change that to uh, bump it up to 2. OK. Oh, perfect. This is great. Um, I think this is a good size. Uh, we can bump it up a bit more, but let's uh, take a look at the other layouts and how the sizes work there. Oh, uh, that's not good. Um, let's edit the next breakpoint. So uh, maybe get rid of this 1,000, set it to 800, and then change this to 600. And uh, desktop, tablet, um, we want to preserve the mobile. So. Um, one tip here with the responsive framework is that on mobile, you don't really want to scale up um, for a lot of phones because then the title bar or the action bar uh, is scaled and it might feel a bit off. So instead, uh, we want to preserve the default of resize behavior. Um, however, you'll see that we can actually set a minimum width. Um, so one problem you might run into with your layouts is the overflow issue on screen sizes that are too small. And if you set a minimum width in the responsive framework, it lets you get around that issue. On small screen sizes, it will uh, make it a bit smaller and make everything just work. OK, let's see how this works. Press play. Um, oh, yeah. Silly me. I forgot to set the scale factor. Scale factor 1.5. Um, scale factor 1.25. OK. Press play. Nice. That works pretty well. So let's check it out on an iPad. Oh, perfect. This is great. It might be a bit too big on an iPad. Bump it down to 1.4, perhaps. Nice. There you have it. In uh, just five or so minutes, we turned this um, classic Flutter app into something that is pretty much presentable um, on the web. And what makes me really happy is if you compare this layout to, say, uh, Redbox, um, Redbox's website or a uh, Voodoo's website, it doesn't actually look too shabby, <laughs> which might say something about their website or, you know, uh, this can definitely be improved, but it's definitely not bad in the sense that um, <laughs> there's multi billion dollar companies out there that have so layout something like this. Uh, great. Uh, and um, later, if we have time, we can actually move the bottom bar um, to the top, which is more in line with how websites work. So there are some elements that we would want to adjust for the web. But this is good for now. OK, back to the agenda. Let's see. So we completed number one and number two. And now let's talk about the responsiveness challenge. OK, this is going to be really, really fun. Um, up, up till now, um, you've seen what the responsive framework does. 
and how it can easily port your um, existing Flutter app to um, a responsive website. But the real um, understanding I want you to take away is the new way of thinking about responsiveness. And to understand why the new way is better than the old way, uh, let's take a look at the current current approach. So one of the hottest things right now, I'm hearing a lot from um, my front end web developer friends is Tailwind CSS. So I took this approach, uh, I took this um, video from Tailwind CSS about how they do responsiveness. Ah, shoot. Why doesn't uh, PowerPoint let you open links in presentation mode? OK, yeah, so you can see I took it directly from their website. This is one of the hottest new uh, CSS frameworks, and this is what they're demoing. So uh, I mean, this approach, you can see that it's, it's the current uh, standard. Now, let me just play this video. And um, so uh, I recommend you, I, I encourage you to watch, and then I'll go over um, the different things um, I noticed and what I don't really like about the current approach. Okay. In that video, what just happened is um, through CSS, um, they made a responsive layout, a responsive profile card. Um, here's the problem though. I've built this responsive card before and the approach that they're using will run into a lot of issues. For example, you have the image and then you have the div and because these are independent components that interact with each other, um, it's the interaction creates a lot of friction. So you assign different, you know, CSS select uh, CSS styles to um, these different components, and then you have to worry about how do they work together. Um, this is also non-obvious to someone coming into working with your existing code. Then um, you have the padding the P6 right here. This is gonna get in trouble when you go to a smaller or a much larger uh, layout. And then you have the flex and the auto, uh, the auto padding. Um, uh, one, this, this example that they provide, they don't show you like what happens if there is more information. For example, if instead of one line, this was two lines. And what happens is that um, the items aren't aligned correctly. Oh, and then the uh-oh here points to the text. Um, so uh, since I've built this uh, design before, um, I, I know that when you make this layout larger, you want the text to also be larger. You want the profile picture to also be larger. And right now, all that is hard coded. Um, so even in this simple, a single profile um, card example, there is so much that has to go into thinking about how do I make this layout responsive on all the different screen sizes. And what ends up happening is we recreate the same layout for different screen sizes. The issue with that is, well, instead of building one layout, you're now building dozens of layouts. Oh, sorry, that's an exaggeration. So Bootstrap has um, extra small, small, medium, large, and extra large. So sometimes you end up you know, building like five different layouts, and then you have the different paddings. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's not a good solution because uh, of all the mental overhead and just recreating it multiple times. Final, uh, also, uh, editing and maintaining multiple layouts. 
that that's the part that really gets you. Um, this layout here, okay, it works, it's perfect, we made it, we, we're done. But when your client comes along um, and asks for a change, and then you have to edit your layout, ooh, now instead of editing one, you're editing you know, three, four, or five. So your work multiplies. Um, and also going into the individual element, because we're, uh, the existing responsiveness approach uses uh, applies responsiveness uh, to individual elements like text images or you know uh, the layouts um, you end up having to uh, go into like the specific details and worry about all the interactions and all of that results in a very unpleasant developer experience so and inconsistencies across devices and being unable to achieve the perfect ui that you want so Bootstrap was published in August of 2011, so almost 10 years ago. And we're still using the same mentality of thinking about building for responsiveness. Now, Bootstrap does, it, it, it worked for its time, and it was good in the sense that um, it supported you know, content uh, very well, but there is something better. And the something better is creating a single layout that works across different screen sizes. Flutter promises to let you, you know, write one, write once, um, have one code base, and deploy it to uh, Android, iOS, and the web. Now, isn't it time to also do that for our layouts? The reason to do so is building a single layout is often easier than building multiple layouts. Um, one exception is layouts that optimize for use of screen space, such as master detail views. Um, so we do want to have like a different layout to leverage the screen space there. Um, and one way to think about the new uh, responsiveness is to understand the distinction between dynamic and static layouts. Bootstrap works well because it supports dynamic content, but it works less so for um, UI layouts. Uh, so one example of that is just really quickly, let's head to CNN. So CNN's layout is um, content-based. So you have news, you have videos that you know change quite often. Um, so this is like a content layout, especially when you click on an article. A static layout are, um, say, a landing page. So say uh, this here. The elements here don't need to flow from a data source and be dynamically rendered. Um, you write the text, you take this design from your designer, and you pretty much run with it. So the new type of responsiveness works well for building out UIs, especially um, very dynamic UIs like we're going to do with um, the Flutter website. And finally, the key is to understand that you know we you don't need to uh, force static layouts like this layout here to work with you know the same. Um, framework as what CNN uses, but these both use Word, WordPress, and that leads to all the challenges we discussed. And by um, locking in layouts at specific sizes, we get the pixel perfect UI that we so desire. Okay, now for the exi exciting part of Recreating the Flutter website in Flutter. If you use Flutter, you've probably been to this website, so you know it pretty well, flutter.dev. And this animation here, uh, this carousel, animated carousel, is pretty beautiful. Um, so let's make it. <laughs> the first step um, that I did 
was to actually make a video recording so I can understand how this layout works. Now, if you're working you know, with a designer, the designer would just give you the assets. So you wouldn't actually have to uh, reverse engineer this design, which is what I'm about to do. Um, so let me open up Premiere Pro. Earlier, before this presentation, I actually recorded a video of the carousel. And let me just drag and drop the carousel, uh, video into Premiere Pro so we can actually analyze what's going on. So this carousel actually has four slides. Slide one, slide two, slide, oh, uh, slide three, and slide four. And a further in-depth um, understanding of how it's built um, through exporting the asset tells us that there are a few layers. So there's a text layer, there's a static frame layer, and there's a, a few background layers. And I've already exported that. So let's go to the Flutter dev a website project that I have open here and fill in you know, the layout using this new um, better approach to responsiveness. OK, um, so the carousel slide. Let me just uh, open this up. Carousel, carousel slide, carousel slide one. Oh, perfect. Um, before starting this presentation, I actually went ahead and created an animation framework. Uh, sorry, not a framework, but just a scaffold for um, animating the slides. Um, I like to think about animation in terms of triggered animations and also timeline animations. So triggered animations, um, say you, you press a button and then you know something pops up like sparks or something um, that's triggered from an event. Here we're dealing with a timeline animation because there's slides, there's things that happen on each slide, and um, it's just easier to think about it that way if we, um, I mean, <laughs> just look at this, right? So we're just going to basically recreate this timeline here uh, very easily. So what this is comprised of is we have the carousel slide. We also have the carousel. And let me just um, demo a, a, uh, the, uh, the scaffold, the animation scaffold. So we understand, so you understand that um, what it's going to look like, uh, what we start from essentially. Carousel slide. Deploy to Chrome and press play. Close that. Don't worry, the audio is still working. I just wanted to let the uh, animation play. Uh, so this slide um, animation scaffold, uh, we provide the slides. And then um, it just animates between them. Now let's take a look at the actual um, carousel slide. What is going on? Uh, it is not building. Ah, OK. Carousel slide cannot find the declaration. Um, scaffold, uh, missing a closing parentheses. Then carousel slide. Let's provide the required slide duration. 
600. Mm. Scaffold. Perfect. Ah, oh, uh, the hot reload stopped working. Gonna reboot it real quick. So what we want to do on the slide uh, while it's loading is we want to have um, essentially a framework for um, animating the items um, in and out. So I've created here an animation controller, um, and uh, this will power the timeline essentially on a per slide basis. Controller dot forward. Um, have fade in animation. Oh, and show slide one uh, direction. Aha. OK, the reason nothing shows at this time is uh, because we set it to false. Um, so another widget that I built uh, to power everything is this widget slide up down fade animation. This is the, uh, what's actually going to make uh, this possible, where the widgets, you know, uh, fade in and fade out. Essentially, I'm leveraging the implicit animations provided by animated opacity, animated container, and a matrix transformation. Uh, you, we're using a matrix transformation here um, because we don't want to create dependencies between um, the, the animated item and uh, the animation behavior. So using a matrix allows us to transform widgets in place. OK, going back, uh, essentially, now we have all our components. We have our carousel animation for, uh, for uh, scaffold. We have our carousel slide scaffold. And then we have the actual animation behavior. Um, if you stuck around until this time, uh, then you get to. Uh, you get the reward of actually the meat and bones of this new approach. Um, so this is going to be pretty radical. Um, so I hope you'll uh, ask a lot of questions and also keep an open mind. Now, how do we get to actually building this layout? Um, <laughs> the way uh, I do it using this new approach is to simply uh, take a screenshot of the layout and then position the items. So let's say we wanted to create this layout here. So I take a screenshot. Uh, OK. And then I'd open up the screenshot in Photoshop or whatever um, graphics editor you use, like Figma or uh, Sketch or any other of those tools. Now, the reason I've opened up it up in Figma, uh, Photoshop is because I want to know the position of each of these elements and their sizes. So prior to this presentation, I've already exported all the assets. Now, it's just a matter of um, knowing where to place each asset and its position. Uh, so let's get the position of this slide background right here. OK. Now, if you actually have the designs, you don't have to do this approximation. This approximation is only for um, figuring out you know, where to place everything. OK, here you go. And before we actually get the positions, we want to set a reference width. Um, I'm setting a reference width of 1,200. And then let's uh, remember the height, too, 848. The reason to have a reference width and height is because, remember, with the responsive framework, um, we're actually scaling, we're scaling the layout. Um, so it doesn't matter, matter the exact width or height, just their aspect ratio. So 1,200 and 639. Perfect. Now, if we go back to our um, slide, our carousel slide, let's set the width to 1,200 and the height to 
639 or 640, just round it up for a nice and even number. Okay. And then uh, we'll use a position and get the positions. from Photoshop. So position top uh, left 35, position top uh, 133, position uh, width um, 577, and position height um, 328. And then add the child, which is an image.asset. And let's get the file name, uh, slide background.jpg. Assets slash images slash slide to background.jpg. And then fit, um, box fit, fill. Okay, I'm uh, just gonna get rid of this one here. Now let's run this and take a look at what we have. Oh, nice. Uh, looks like we're getting somewhere, but we don't know until we position all the assets. Um, this is very encouraging though. It looks somewhat similar. Let's keep on going. We're making good progress and doing a bit low on time, but uh, let's keep on going. Um, so, okay, just drag another asset, slide two, and there's just two left. So uh, we'll we'll be good. Um, nudge it a little bit so we get the right um, position, and then just duplicate this. And get the name, slide to layer one, dot PNG, and then fill in the uh, position, which is uh, 147, height of 133, width of 728, and a height of 303. And then let's press play and see what we get. Oh, nice. I think we're on the right track. But due to the lack of time, um, let's actually take a look at the completed um, animation, uh, the completed slide. So. Scaffold responsive wrapper. Here we're actually using the responsive wrapper to wrap the widget itself. Okay. Import child um, carousel slide one dur slide duration of six hundred. 6,000 milliseconds, and the size of 640. Okay. Oh, uh, the hot reload stopped working. Let me just press play.
open up the carousel. Oh, yes, um, we do need to add in our animation listeners, though. Uh, let me just do that real quick. Oh, wow. Okay. And get rid of this uh, button here. Okay. Position raise button. Okay. And animation listener. Right. Now this should work. Nice. Terrific. Uh, we might want to play around with the animation duration a bit. So maybe like 500 instead of 300. But uh, you get the gist. So um, this whole process has been pretty pain free. Oh, and uh, the key star here is, of course, uh, the responsive framework. So um, let's just do a responsiveness check and see how everything looks on different screen sizes. Oh, wow. So the layout responds perfectly on all of the screen sizes. And the process is also quite quick as well, where we just took you know, a literal design and then uh, got the position of elements and then uh, put it into the stack positioned them, and animated them. Um, so thank you for watching. And unfortunately, there was so much that we didn't get to. Um, for example, our layout discussions or creating you know, different layouts for desktop and mobile and embedding. Uh, but I guess that's something for next time. So um, I'd like to open up for any questions. Does Responsive Builder automatically scale features which were of dimensions like a container with height of 100 pixels? Do we need to use media query every place? Um, no, you don't. That's what's so beautiful. So now with the Responsive Wrapper, um, you don't need to do the manual media queries. Uh, before, a quick example would be, so say we wanted to uh, set the width or height, right? So the container width, you would do media query dot of size oh, of context by size dot width and then multiplied by a scale factor. But that's the individual element approach that we want to move away with. We want a top down responsiveness approach where those responsive controls are put at the top and then whatever data is inherited down below. So the replacement, if you want to do like a specific, um, doing a specific you know, element, if you want to really position an element and it doesn't work um, uh, otherwise without, you know, additional information, you can actually do responsive uh, wrapper data con, um, dot of context, oh, responsive wrapper dot of context dot screen width or height. Okay, uh, next question. Um, someone post the link. Okay, Flutter week one dot questions. Um, okay, just take a look at the question. Can you please address cores errors and the geolocation API? Baseflow's geolocator package isn't useful yet for web. I'm using constant is web and the JS Dart package. Um, there is a way to disable cores. Um, I haven't uh, played around with the cores issue just yet. So um, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't have the exact answer to your question there, unfortunately. Uh, next question. Uh, going from an app to web, you use the responsive package, but if you start with Flutter web, is the responsive package necessary? It is necessary, um, only in the sense that you want to make your life a lot easier, right? So go, uh, going back to earlier in the demo, um, 
at the very beginning, actually, for uh, if you started watching earlier, uh, this is a non-responsive website, but it is developed in a way that it can easily be made responsive. And uh, this is what you get if you don't res uh, use the responsive package. Using the responsive framework, um, you get something that you know becomes responsive. So the responsive framework helps you build respo responsive Flutter websites. A uh, Tailwind CSS, <laughs> a question about Tailwind. Um, so the question here actually comes from their website. Um, in fact, their marketing claim is that, sorry, not marketing claim, their um, sell is that if you're sick of fighting the framework, Tailwind was made for you. So isn't Flutter already performing this role with Dart? And isn't Flutter enough? Yes, well, with Flutter, you don't have any CSS um, you have a tiny bit of HTML, as you can see here, and this lets you do a lot of um, add a lot of other scripting capabilities. But all of this here is provided to you by Flutter, which is so great. Um, yes, I would say uh, you don't need any of all the other, you know, CSS frameworks, Bootstrap, uh, 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 all those other, you know, frameworks. Just Flutter works. It works, and that's what that that's the promise. That's what we wanted. Isn't Flutter by definition responsive? One code base to rule them all. Dynamic versus static layouts. Isn't the point of frame Flutter to not need more frameworks? Uh, yes. So <laughs> uh, I call it the responsive uh, framework because there are quite a bit of um, Flutter web challenges. Um, and you need a bit of utility methods to solve these challenges. Um, there's a, uh, so, so building uh, just the Flutter website, it's not going to you know, work completely. Um, there's going to be things that you have to do to make it work. Um, and the responsive framework is um, to, supposed to encapsulate all um, the frame, uh, all of those things that you need to get a website working responsibly. Um, so it's not a framework in the sense that it runs parallel to Flutter. It is a sense of framework and it's something to build upon and that works and makes Flutter better. Um, and isn't Flutter by definition responsive? Um, it resizes. So, but with um, how logical pixels and display independent, uh, density independent pixels work, um, you do need um, a little bit of that magic that we covered in, uh, provided by the responsive framework. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one last question. Uh, do you know any resources with guidelines for building responsive Flutter apps? There are actually quite a bit of resources. Um, and if you search, you know, uh, Flutter responsiveness, you actually get a link from Google to all these great articles. Um, there's something called the Layout Builder you might have heard of um, that's used by a lot of different approaches or the Media Query, um, Media Query Data dot size times, you know, scale factor. Um, but that's going with the old way of doing things. And we want something easier, which is why I built the responsive framework, um, which if you give it a try, um, you saw that it was, I think, I'd say quite a bit easier. Well, uh, that's, all, that's all the time for questions we have. Um, thanks everyone for watching. And I do hope this framework will make your life easier. And now that you've seen what Flutter Web can do and how easy it is, um, there's no better time to get started. Thank you.